strength. Uh, when you have tears, it can dry your tears. You know, when you have sorrow, it can, it can bring you joy. When you have sickness, it can bring you health. I mean, it's just so many things that this book is capable of doing. But have we not all seen the book sitting on a coffee table or sitting in a room and or maybe even a bathroom? I don't know. I mean, sometimes we use this book as a decoration. You know, we just kind of set it out. You know, um, and, and it's way more than that, guys. And when I saw the video, I thought, yeah, it's kind of corny. It's kind of crazy, you know. But the reality is, is we don't need to look at that book any other way than what it really is. And it's life. It's living. It's a living book. And that's really, you know, my heart over the next several weeks, like I said the last time I ministered with you guys, is we're going to establish what is God's will. I mean, a lot of times we, we hear people talk about, man, we need to do God's will or, or you know, what is God's will for your life? And, and what I want to establish with no tradition and no religion, the unfiltered will of God, not will of God through a man's idea, the will of God through a church, the will of God through a, a, a sermon somebody preached. I want us to look at the word of God and I want us to unpack what is the will of God, okay, whether I like it or not. I want to know what the will of God is because there's no way that I can ever be all of what God's called me to be if I don't know what he is or who he is or what is his will, okay? And a lot of times we derive that based on going to a church and the preacher gets up there and preach like he said, I don't turn in the Bible unless somebody tells me to turn into it. A lot of times people will live their life for God based on what somebody else said, how they should live for God, okay? And that's not how you live for God. You live for God based off of the Word of God and what somebody teaches you, but you study this book, friend. Get in this book, because there's the freedom right here in this book, in the pages of this book, and you won't get thrown off. So and today we're going to just kind of, you know, pick up a little bit of what we did last week, but, you know, over the last past week, I kind of, I began to start reading in 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians all the way to Revelations. Then we're going to back up, and I'm going to add Romans, and I'm going to do it again, because those letters that Paul was given the words to by God, not just Paul, but Peter, John, and, and so forth, they were meant for us to use them as directions in our life. We were supposed to be living out the New Testament. That is to us. Y'all in this room, that is for us. Now, the Old Testament's great. You should read that. But I would encourage you to get the New Testament down first, then go back and read the Old Testament, and you'll even see that the New Testament is even more alive. Hallelujah. Because the New, the New Testament derives from the Old Testament and what they did. So before I pray and we get into the message, I do want to say there is a few announcements. Uh, I want to say, man, thanks to all y'all that are coming out for the Freedom Group. Man, come on, give yourself a hand, man. Y'all are doing it, man. I tell you what, I was in my little cottage up there in Helen and I peeked into the camera right there and I thought, wow, man, they packed out in there. And, and, and you know, did Lori do a good job? Yeah. She did a good job. Oh, man, I know she did. She's up here. She kept y'all way too long, though. No, I'm just kidding. No, she, she, she knows how we roll. No, y'all y'all look like y'all had a good time, man. It was really, you know, uh, it was fun watching all you guys. But we're going to do it again this Monday. And if you say, well, I haven't been coming to the, you know, uh, small group. Well, come on anyway. It don't matter. You're going to, huh? Man, I'm sorry. Wednesday at 7. Connie, like, man, well, I got to look at my schedule. Where's it going? He had days, man. I don't know about the guy. I got things to do. But no, Wednesday at 7. Uh, but if you, you say, well, man, I haven't been to any of them, it don't matter. Come on out. Because that could be the one you need. That could be the one word you hear. You know, God can do a mi miracle things. You know what I'm saying? So make your way out here. Come on out. And those of you that have been coming, hey, uh, keep coming because it's going to be good. Uh, and the teens, too. I mean, we've got the teens meeting. I think Lori will be shifting in the teens, uh, the cafe is coming up Wednesday, so make your way out for that. And they're learning some deep stuff. <laughs> I mean, you teenagers, man, y'all, y'all might be preaching after y'all get out of that book. <laughs> y'all got man, Israel from the beginning to the end, man. We all we going from the garden to heaven, you know, up in the rapture, man. And that thing, man, you got it all. It's a good study. Uh, and then the women, y'all are going to have a Zoom meeting tomorrow at seven p.m. So you don't even have to leave your house, okay? And we sent y'all a text in church out. All the women got a text in church. If you read your text in church. Some don't read their text in church. Don't call us out on Sunday. Yeah, man. No, I'm not just calling y'all out. I'm calling the whole church out. Man, when I send out a text in church, do you know that that's got words on it? <laughs> that means you got to hit open. And then you actually got to read it. You know? People come to church. Oh, I didn't get no text. Oh, really? 
Okay, well, let me go check and see. No, I said you got a text. Oh, yeah, I did. Uh, oh, sorry about that. You know, come on, man. I even tried to put a picture on there where you have a little bit extra to look at, you know. I mean, I work hard to get the text to you. So, yeah, the ladies are going to have uh, a little uh, Zoom meeting tomorrow. Again, I mean, that's, that's, if you can do it, then Zoom's easy. You ain't even going to leave your house, you know. Just go ahead and hit open. You ain't even got to show your face or nothing. So that'll be tomorrow at 7. And we're going to send out all the connection stuff. So tomorrow, ladies, if you get a text, or if you're here and you're a lady and you say, well, I didn't get a text, well, then let us know, okay, because we want to make sure you get it. But I'll be sending out, uh, or, you know, Belinda will be sending out the information for that tomorrow to where you can get hooked up with that. And then next Sunday, we're going to be doing our next steps, starting that out. So if you've never been through our next steps, we will be starting that out. We'll give you a little bit of lunch and all that and uh, have a good time with that. So I wanted to let you guys know about that. So that being said, we're good to go. I think that's it. I hope I got everything. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we just thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that your word is life unto our lives, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, that as we open it up, that Holy Spirit, you take these scriptures, you take these things, and you just bring it to us, and that we have eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying to us. And I just thank you, Lord, that this book will be easy to understand. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter 3. I'm going to go there first. But in our first message on God's perfect will, we talked about how everything that is happening on the earth is not God's will. I mean, I spent a good time really talking about how, you know, that what we see going on the earth today, uh, you know, with the bad things, uh, it's, it's, it's not all, God's not behind the bad things, okay? So when you see you know, tragedy going on or tornadoes sweeping through, you know, uh, cities and towns and just killing people. And, and, and you're seeing people that are, that are dying unexpectedly and all the, God don't bring death to nobody. God is a God of life. Okay. And I know sometimes uh, religion has tried to define tragedy the best they can. And when they do, they start using terminology. Well, you know, everything is the mysterious will of God. Or, or we don't understand why things happen, but somehow it, it, it had to be the will of God. And, and guys, you know, I, I know what they're trying to do when they say that. They're trying to soothe somebody that may have lost a loved one. But in reality... You're ignoring the one who's literally behind it. And we've got to acknowledge that there is a devil and demon. There is somebody that's evil that's running the face of this earth. He's the one that's trying to knock people out. Now, again, he even will bring death to Christians. You know, there's a lot of Christians that die early. They should not have died. That don't mean they went to hell. They just went to heaven early. Y'all do know that we can make mistakes, right? We're prone, right? I mean, let me make sure I'm in the right house here. Is there any perfect people that's never made a mistake in this house right here? So the potential for us to have an oops moment is, is really, the percentage is pretty high. That we can have one of those days to where, you know, Luke, we were supposed to go left. We took the right. It didn't go well. Okay? But, but who's that on? It's on us. The devil didn't do it. God didn't do it. Okay? We have consequences for our actions you know, both good and bad. That don't mean you're a bad person because something bad happened to you, okay? It's just we live in a fallen world, okay? But I don't want us to get to the place to where we blame God. I mean, we just can't blame God for any bad thing. He's just too good. And when you start pointing at Him, you're leaving out the one that really is bad. I mean, the Bible says the devil comes to do what? So if you take those categories and then everything that falls under that category, well, it's pretty obvious according to the Bible, according to the will of God, Who's behind the bad? Well, I don't understand why, why they... I mean, you'll even hear people that, you know, maybe lose like a, a two or three-year-old. And I mean, I've heard of things like this where somebody would walk up to them and says, Hey, look, you know what? God took your baby because He knew what was up ahead for that little baby girl. And see, that's... I mean, how did that make you feel when I just said it? I mean... It don't, that don't make me feel good at all. And there's some people that will hear that and maybe not do anything with it, but I've heard of some incidents where I say, well, if God's like that, I don't want nothing to do with him. And I don't blame him. I don't blame him. I mean, you come up here telling me God took my kid, and then now you're going to ask me to serve that God? Can you see how religion and, and, and stuff like that can just really bog down somebody that really wants to meet this good, good God? Friend, there's a lot of things that are happening on this earth we don't understand. 
And newsflash, there's going to be a lot more happen on this earth that we don't understand. But there's two categories. There's good and there's evil. Good, God. Evil, devil. Make it simple. Don't make it difficult. And don't try to explain everything. You know the word I, or the words I don't know? It's okay to use that, Connie. I don't know. I don't know. How about that? We don't know. Why has it always got to be God's fault? I mean, here he is up there perfect, sent his son to save us. I mean, he's doing everything he can to sustain us every day. You don't even know what could have happened in your life last week that he kept you out of. He's working overtime to make sure we get from point A to point B. And somebody trips and falls and ends up, you know, dying at an early age. And we go, well, why did God let that happen? Well, you don't even know what he's been trying to do to even get him to that point. God is good. And my Bible says that goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. I'm not looking back and thinking, God, why are you doing this? If God's a part of the problem, we in trouble, y'all. <laughs> we in trouble. I mean, if God has anything to do with evil and destroying, that's bad news for us. Be honest with you. I ain't going to preach no more <laughs> if he's got anything to do with bad. No, God is good all the time. And even in the midst of your, 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 your uh, pain and struggle, Know that God is right there with you. And if you'll keep looking toward him, he will see you out. Amen. So we spent some time on that. But today we're going to start looking at what God's will is. But before I do that, I want to share with you a passage of scriptures that describe what is going on in some Christians in the church. You know, the Bible really will actually talk to you about everything that's going on. Hallelujah. But in 2 Peter 3, and this is the will of God too, so we need to hear it all. And it says, and remember our Lord's patience. Gives people time to be saved. Boy, ain't that a good statement. That means the reason why he is so patient with some people that you think are demons and devils is because he wants them to be saved. I mean, there is people that we've all come across that think, if the devil ever wore clothes, that would be him right there. That would be her. <laughs> the devil has just found a body he's living in. We've all had those people in our life. But God is so patient because he wants everybody to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, speaking of these things in all of his letters. Some of his comments are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture. Christians are notorious for taking scriptures and making them appeal to their behavior. Making them fit their carnality. They'll take scriptures out of context to actually make what they're doing okay. I mean, have you ever heard, you know, Jesus turned the water into wine? Come on, everybody's heard that one. Every person that wants to hit that bottle wants to say that, okay? That's just a guarantee. We're going to have to use the water into wine scenario, okay? He turned the water into wine, okay? Nowhere does it say in that whole passage of him turning the water into wine, hey, guys, go get you a fifth of liquor and have fun. But that's how we interpret Scripture sometimes. And this is why I wanted to say this is because this is what's going on in the church and the devil is behind it. When we take scriptures out of context to fit a lifestyle that is not flowing within the scriptures, you know you've took that scripture out of context and you're twisting it. This letter was written to who? Christians. This letter that Peter wrote was to Christians, not sinners. A sinner is not going to be guilty of taking a scripture out of context. <laughs> they ain't looking to do that. Okay? They're okay with what they're doing and they're going to keep doing it. But us as believers have got to be on guard that we're not using Scripture to fit our lifestyle. And that's why I want to spend some time on the will of God to where we can see these things. But it goes on to say this. And it says, and this will result in their what? Destruction. Christians using Scriptures that, 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 that they're ignorant and unstable about, they're twisting them and using them to fit their lives or fit the things that they want to do that ain't right. It will eventually destroy them. Well, verse 17, it says, you already know these things, dear friends. So he, he must have been writing this letter and they already knew it. 
So he says, so be on your guard, then you will not be carried away by the heirs of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is something that's echoed throughout the uh, New Testament. That we are called to grow in our knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one we pattern our lives by. He's the one that we try to be like. We're going to act like somebody, we're going to act like Jesus. How did he act? That's how I want to act. I mean, I think everybody in the room here would say that Jesus lived a pretty successful life. Wouldn't you think that? I mean, I think he lived a successful life. He helped a lot of people. He did a lot of good things. So by following Jesus, I think we would do okay, right? And there was something that followed with Jesus, and it was called the power of the Holy Spirit. So wherever he went, he had the Holy Spirit with him. So rather than us follow people that are trying to twist things, let's grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's find out what God's will is, and then let's walk in it with complete obedience that we will not fall in the lives of the devils. There's another scripture I want you guys to jot down and underline in your Bible, and I'm going to probably refer to this a good bit. It's in Isaiah 119. Isaiah 119, the Bible says, if, if, everybody say if, if, if you are willing and obedient you shall do what? Eat the good of the land. But see, the key to that is a condition. See, some people think with God everything's automatic. It's not. There is a big condition to God's promises working in our life, and it's right here. If you are willing and obedient, then you and I are going to eat the good of the land. Does God want us to eat the good of the land? Yes, he does. He don't want us to eat, you know, crumbs and, 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 and leftovers and all that. No, he wants us to have the good of the land. But it's, it's, it's pending whether we're going to be willing and obedient to his word. And the reason why I use that scripture is because what I'm going to share with you guys over the next several weeks, you've got to come to the conclusion. I'm not going to make you do it. You've got to come to the conclusion. Are you going to be willing and obedient? Because, guys, we're coming into some days to where, I'll be honest with you, man, and I'm not God, but in my view, I don't know what else he's waiting on. I mean, this, this is pretty, pretty crazy what's going on in the world. Um, and, and, and we need to be praying for the people of Ukraine and, and, and those are innocent people over there that are being bombed. You know, I was talking to Belinda. I said, you know, I mean, we look at these nations and all that, and we see all this turmoil going on, and, and you go, man, why is all this going on? I can tell you, it's, it's summed up in two things. Power and greed, period. All wars are, are, are done by power and greed, the love of money, the love of power. They just want more of it. So why not be happy with just your country of Russia? Why do we got to run over here to Ukraine? Power, greed, sums all wars up. But the deal is, is there's innocent people in Ukraine there's Christians, your brothers and my brothers and sisters in Ukraine right now that are dodging bombs. And the reality is, it would be no different than here. You know, Russia ain't far from USA. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, you got Alaska and you got Russia. Boom, okay? My point is, is what would it be like if we had bombs going off in our backyard? Because those people are having catastrophe all around them and they don't know where the next bomb is going to fall. That's why it's so important that your heart be ready because we don't know when we're going to be out of here. I mean, we, we say we live in America and there's nothing going to come against us. We're good. We're mighty. We're strong. Well, I can tell you right now, honey, <laughs> you know, anything could happen, okay? And to have that mentality would be foolish. And that's why when you see Pray for Ukraine on your Facebook feed, that's not just a good picture. Pray for them. Pray for these people. Pray for these countries. Pray for the people in Russia. I mean, there's citizens in Russia that don't agree with this, and they're trying to stand, you know, against it as well. I mean, so, again, let's, let's, let's pray for these people and, and help them be able to uh, see the light. Amen? If is the key word in this verse, meaning it's conditional to what will happen. People will sometimes say, well, what about them? They're not Christians, and they're successful. Have you ever heard that? I mean, they don't go to church. They don't read their Bible. And look at them. They got all this nice stuff. Let's be real. Can you be successful without God? Absolutely. <laughs> you can be rich without God. Filthy rich. I mean, you can have some good stuff. I mean, we see it all around us. 
Billionaires don't, I mean, some of them are atheists. They don't claim to be Christians. So you can be a billionaire without God. You can be rich without God. But is that true success? In a lot of people's eyes, they look at that. They aspire to be like some of these people because they do have material things and they have nice stuff. But is that really truly success? Well, it is based on this earth. It's based on their time here, it is. But the thing about with, with success, if you do it God's way, is there's things that you're going to need in life that money can't buy. There's going to be times that maybe you face a report that you got cancer and you got two months to live. And as far as the world goes, you're done. As far as the doctors are concerned, you're done. No matter how much money you got in the bank, do you know two months you're dead is as, is as powerful whether you're a billionaire or whether you have nothing? That means there's nothing you can do. So no matter how successful you've been, you got two months to kiss every dollar bill goodbye because you're about to leave. But see, if you're a follower in Christ and you're spending time close to him, you find out that God's will is that you can be healed. God desires for you to be healed. He can heal you. And it don't cost you nothing. Just some time with him, which is that's always good. What about some peace? Do you think maybe some of these people that's got billions of dollars could be a little bit unstable? Maybe they don't have the peace that they would like to have? Again, anybody can put on, and then listen, when y'all see them on the red carpet and they're coming out with their nice outfits and they're standing there looking at the camera and they're smiling and they're hugging their eighth wife, man, look, you know, I'm telling you, anybody can put on a front. We see it on Sundays, right? How you doing? Oh, blessed, highly favored, doing great. Whoa, God's good. Cry all the way back home. Upset. Life ain't going well. So anybody's going to put on their best. Those people are human just like you and me. Even though they got all that stuff, they still got to do that. But ain't you glad that when you serve Christ and you're successful in God and doing His way, guess what? We have somebody that can give us peace when the world can't give us that. I'm just telling you, there's things that you're going to get with God you ain't going to get in success with the world. And Jesus even said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world or a woman, a woman who gains the whole world but loses their soul? So at the end, if you've got all this stuff and you die and you don't have God and you go to a place of destruction, what then? That's not what we want, guys. I want my wealth, and I mean a lot of it. You're going to a church, and I believe that there's millionaires in this church. I believe there's going to be millionaires come out of this church. I believe there's millionaires that he's going to raise up in this church. We are called to be very, very wealthy. But we're going to do it God's way. Amen? I mean, everybody in this room, if I said, look, man, do y'all want to get the gospel to every creature and get them saved? You would say, probably, hopefully, everybody would say, yes. Do you know it costs money to do that? <laughs> I mean, it ain't cheap. I mean, look, man, it ain't cheap at all. It costs a lot of money. So guess what? We need money to do what God's called us to do. That's another religious teaching that God, you know, don't want you to have anything. Man, I'd run out of that church. Again, serve God, but he don't want you to have nothing. Really? That's idiotic, man. Come on. God wants you to have stuff. He just don't want you to, he don't want the stuff to have you. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, yes, you can be successful without him, but we don't want to be successful without him. Our main text, and I want us to go to that right now. Hallelujah. I just wanted to say that because when you get saved, it's almost like the devil wants you to see other people that ain't saved doing good. You know, kids going to school, teenagers, you know, go to school. You know, and they, they, mom and daddy tell them to read the Bible, go to church. You know, don't cuss, don't swear, don't drink, don't do drugs. And they go to school and everybody's doing them and having fun. I mean, the guy's high in science class. What's going on? But you sitting there like a bum on a log. Yeah, I gotta read the Bible. You know, what I'm he does that. He puts these people out there like they look like they got it all together, having a good time. You know. In reality, man, you don't know what that cat's going through. But he will. He'll show you pictures of all that. So we we don't want to be successful that way. You know, you cannot be high and smile and have fun. I don't need one ounce of alcohol or drugs to go out and have fun. I'll dance with the best of them, Jack. Bring it on. We'll have a good time. I mean, I go to weddings where they be drinking and stuff, and I get out there on that dance floor and do the macarena. Come on. Da, da, da. Woo, come on now. You know, have a little fun, man. 
It's going to be real with you, Jack. Come on. What is that? What is it? You do the one step, turn around. What's that called? I don't know what it's called. But you know what? I have fun. You can have fun. I've went to Panama City or, or, and go on the boat. You know, they got the boat with the unlimited alcohol. You know, everybody wants to get on that boat. Woo! Give me that boat. I like that boat. How much? Don't matter. I want this boat. It's got, it's got everything I need on it right here. So I get on it. And what you want? What you want to drink, man? We got it all. What you want to drink? Oh, man, I take water. What? Yeah, water. Where's the dance floor at? Let's go. Come on. Get the music going. Let's go, boys. I don't have to have that. Why? I didn't quit having fun when I got saved. I just changed who I danced with. Amen? You still can have fun. Amen? You can still have a good time. I don't have to have this world stuff. I ain't going to get it in heaven. What you going to do? Show up in heaven? Well, God, I was really rocking the floor when they had that bottle flying. You got some, you got some juice around here? I need some juice. I need something. You got a joint or something, God? You know? You ain't going to have that when you get there. Why, why do I need it down here? Just because the world says you got to have it, oh, screw that. I don't need that. I got Jesus, glory to God. We have a good old time. In the living room, in the car, in that don't matter. Walmart, don't matter. You can have a good time, glory to God. You can get high on the most high, glory to God. Don't stop getting high. Just quit using that stuff, amen? I mean, he's got some stuff. Get in prayer, sing some songs, worship God, you know? Run around the church, get excited, you know? Come to church expecting, man, God's going to do something, Amen. Hallelujah. Man, bring the church alive. We can have parties in here. I don't have no script of how you're supposed to act in church. I don't want one. You come in here, man, God touches you. Man, feel free. Kick a few chairs out of the way. Have fun. I don't care. You know, I don't know what you've been through, and I don't know what God's doing, but it ain't none of my business. Hallelujah. You have fun. It's your daddy, and you his daughter, and you his son. Have fun up in church. Amen. You ain't going to say that when somebody comes to a party. Everybody's drinking, the keg's flowing, we're flying high. Woo, yeah. Guy comes in and kicks off, kicks his few chairs over and goes crazy. You can be like, woo, yeah, man, what you got? What you doing? Come on, baby, let's go, you know? He just, he just joins the party. So, man, really, man, we serve an awesome God, man. Get excited about God, amen? He's good, amen? Well, I got to go to church today, you know, if I don't go, Pastor, I'm going to take you. Come on, really? I mean, I get to get up and get ready to come in here and worship God and have fun, amen? Go to God, have a good time in Jesus. Glory to God. I'm going to have fun when I leave too. So are you. Amen. Come on. Let's all smile and be happy. So Romans 12, 1 and 2. Jeez. Man, I got a lot to get to. <laughs> Come on. This is 11, 26. Hallelujah. All right. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. And really, this is everything to do with our church right here, man. We, our church is right in the middle of these two verses right here. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And like we said a couple weeks ago, who's going to present what? You are going to present your body. Not God. You're going to do it. You want to present that body living, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So we're going, to, we're going to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Do you know in order to live holy, you're going to have to find out what holy living means? And then you're going to have to decide to lay yourself down and pick up what he wants. Amen. That's what it's talking about. You're going to lay down your body as a sacrifice. Meaning that he's going to tell you to do some things or not do some things that guess what? You're going to want to do. You can't even experience sacrifice until you're having to not do what you want to do. You understand that? <laughs> That's what sacrifice is, okay? So he goes on to say in verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we want to be transformed. We don't want to conform. Do you know it's easy to conform? You know how you conform to the world? You know how you do it? I'm going to give you a one-step program on how to conform to the world. Real easy. Real easy. Nothing. Nothing. You don't have to do nothing. Just get up and go and do whatever. You conform to the world real quick. But when you, when, you, when you begin to get transformed, guys, there's going to be some resistance. Amen? Can we know the perfect will of God for our lives? Or is, is God doing this? Okay. Lori goes to prayer. She, had, she does have a prayer ministry. If y'all want to support her prayer ministry, she's a faithful servant of God. So, Lori, she goes to prayer, and she asks God, God, show me your will for my life. So she leaves prayer. And the next day, she leaves her house. And Lori is like almost getting ready to touch the will of God. I mean, it's getting real close, so God does this. He moves it away from her. Because, you know, he, he, he don't want her to get it, right? 
He's trying to hide the will of God for her. So he's moving that will. So she, she's still praying and she's asking God and he just keeps, he don't want her to get it. He's hiding the will from her. Is that what God's doing? Or is he, or is he like right here? Come on, Lord. You almost there. You almost there. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is he getting excited? Yeah, that's what he's doing. He wants you to find out what he put inside of you. He ain't trying to hide it from you. The problem is, is we're about to get right there to get in the will of God. Hey, bro, what you doing Saturday night? Oh, well, uh, you know what? I was just thinking about that. You know, uh, hey, come on, hang out with us, dog. We're gonna be, we're gonna be doing it, man. We're gonna be bringing it down. Okay. And then they walk away from the will of God. Is God going to quit trying to get you in the will? No, he's going to keep working with you. But how many times, oh, man, you know, come on, man, let's go do this. Let's go do that. You know, hey, won't you say this? Or you, you're at work and you begin to just blow up at work and get mad at somebody. And God's sitting there drinking, trying to give you some info. And you're cussing the, next, the person in your cubicle out. There you go. <laughs> well, time out. I guess we'll have to work another day. Okay. God is not trying to not get you in the will of God. It's us that he's working with. Amen. And how many of y'all deal with people? Relatives, friends, co-workers. Are all of them perfect? Is there some of them that you got to say the same thing to over and over? Some of those might be your kid. Okay. So, I mean, guys, look, when you're dealing with people, come on, get God's perspective, man. Look at what he's dealing with. It's a hot mess down here, okay? <laughs> he's trying to get everybody to do the right thing, and a lot of them don't want to do the right thing. We're eyeballing the wrong thing, amen? So God is constantly working, just like we constantly work with our kids and those we're, we're around. So we want to, to know the will of God, and we can. Many people struggle with the idea of knowing God's will. They'll say, is it God's will to do this or have this? You know, whenever I have somebody come up to me, and I've had this, whether I was a pastor or just, just somebody went to church, and they say, hey, Nathan, do you think it's wrong to do this? The very fact that you ask me that question, your answer is yes, that's wrong for you to do. Hello, would you let, like, turn the lights on? He's telling you, don't do this. Well, man, you know, man, I just, you know, I've seen this person do it. You know, I just wondering, is it wrong for me to do it? Yeah, it's wrong for you to do it. It's wrong for them to do it. Well, they go to church all the time, man, and, 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 and they, they were doing this. I, I don't care. I mean, man, you know, somebody that goes to Walmart all the time, you know, but yet one day they go in there and they shoot a bunch of people. Well, they went to Walmart all the time and they shot. Does that mean everybody that's in Walmart is like that person that shot them? No. I mean, you're saying just because somebody does something stupid don't mean you've got to duplicate it. Amen. That's why you need. See, people shouldn't be your Bible. And I think that's what a lot of Christians do. They'll, they'll go to church and then they'll leave and then they'll look at everybody else's life. Okay, well, they're doing that. I guess I can do that. They're doing that. I guess I can do that. No, that's how you quit church. That's how you quit serving God. If you start looking at people, amen? Because guess what, Mary? We can make some goofball mistakes, can't we? We can. We all can. Don't even look at me. I mean, yeah, I would say follow me as I follow Christ. But follow Christ first. Let me be a secondary, okay? Because I, I still can get upset. I still can do things wrong, amen? I know y'all don't, but I do. I still, you know, I have to deal with some of these people too. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they'll say, well, will God heal me? Will God bless me financially? Does God love me? Is he for me or against me? You know, that, that can be, <laughs> you look at that sometimes. You're like, man, everything's been going to hell lately in my life. Has God even, where'd he go, you know? He's there. And this is a big one right here. I've made a mess of my life. Will he still help me? You even have this outside of church. You know, when you invite somebody to church and you say, hey, bro, why don't you come to church with me, man? Oh, man, dude, I ain't, I ain't really, you know, I'm still doing some bad things and I don't know. I just, I want to try to straighten up a little bit before I do anything like that, man, you know. Or either I don't have some clothes. I don't know, you know, I don't know, man. I just, I just don't, you know, you'll hear that sometimes when you talk to people, you know, they're in the world and stuff. You know, and in, in, in church, you know, they can maybe had a bad relationship. Maybe they were in church and they, you know, said something bad about somebody. Maybe they, whatever. You can have these feelings of emotions that you, you feel like you're just not, you've messed up. And sometimes when you're in that place, you kind of think, man, is God even around? Is he close to me? Will he accept me back based on all of what I did? And the answer is yes, he will. There's nothing you can do that will stop God from loving you. Nothing you can do. You can't go too far that God will not still 
reach out and pull you back. I don't care who you are. Amen? Religion will tell you certain things. Tradition may tell you certain things. But God is always reaching for those that will reach just a little bit. All he needs is a little bit. Peter was drowning in the water. And he was about to go under. And he said, Lord, save me. Jesus didn't use his head as the last stepping stone to get in the boat. He probably thought it. No, he didn't. But he reached down and he grabbed him. And he pulled him up. And that is a picture of sometimes our life we can look like and feel like we're about to drown. And God is saying, I got you. Come here. I got you. I'll help you. All he needs us to do is to look toward him. Amen. Give him a little bit of something to work with. The world is going one way, but God wants you and I to go the opposite way of the world. Have y'all noticed that? If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to go the opposite way of the world 99% of the time. Okay? That means what they say how they live, how they act, a good portion of that, we are not going to duplicate it. Amen? Not all of it. There's a lot of good people out there, okay? You know, there's a lot of good people out there. They're doing a lot of good things. And some of that you can learn from. But I'm just saying the majority of what's going on in our world is pushing towards, you know, evil, ungodly things, okay? So we, we got to be careful that we don't, we don't get caught up in that. Amen? The way we do that is by allowing God to transform us into a new person by changing the way we think with His Word. Amen? Hallelujah. The Bible. Can we know the perfect will of God? Ephesians 5.17 says this. Not only can we know it. Look at what Pete, uh, Paul says right here in Ephesians 5.17. He says, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul is telling everybody that would read this. It says, Look, He showed me the will of God, and I became an apostle of His. He's got a will for you and me, and He wants to show it to you. But do you know the only way somebody can show you something is you've got to sit down with them? I mean, I could have something that I want to show you, but what if you never, ever sit down with me and spend time with me? I could never show you that. Or what if you're just kind of living your life, you know, waiting for him to show you or waiting for me to show you something through somebody else? That ain't going to work. Amen? So you've got to take time and you've got to sit down with the one who has all the stuff you need. And it don't take much. And again, you don't have to prepare yourself and be perfect before you stand before God. Because if we did that, nobody would get before God, okay? He likes it when you come to Him and you don't know King James Bible. <laughs> you don't know thus thee thou though. That you actually sit down and say, Daddy, I ain't got a clue who you are, but I want to know you. I want to know your ways. I want to know. And you're honest with Him. That's when He begins to start showing you some things. God's will for all people is found in the Bible concerning, and I wrote down several things, but concerning healing, salvation, joy, success, money, peace, value. You want to know how valuable you are? Get into the book. Meaning, right and wrong, good and bad, direction, purpose. All this is found in God's word, God's will. God's will is important and something we need to desire to do above all else. But when we start to do God's will in a world that is not doing it, and in some cases Christians are not doing it, then they will try to get us to follow them. And uh, I had, you know, in my mind an example that I wanted to use that, you know, have y'all ever seen a stream, like a river stream coming out of the mountains? Yes, we have seen a river stream come out of the mountains. Did y'all know that the river, that stream is going one way, Right? Always going one way. That means you're not going to be sitting there looking at the stream going, man, that's beautiful. Look how clear that water is. And then all of a sudden it's going to hit reverse and go back upstream. It's not going to happen, okay? It means it's all going downstream. Me and Belinda, we went on, on some trail, uh, you know, uh, doing some trails up in Helen and all up in that area there. And I had my little soul car, okay? And we're kind of cruising back through the woods here in kind of a remote type area and very narrow roads. And, and I got this little car and then we come up to this one, and it goes down, and man, you're looking at the creek. you got to literally cross the creek to go to the other side. So we both jumped out. We looked at that and went, uh-uh. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. So we turned around, and we didn't do it. Well, the next day we went, she her phone, finding these trails. So we ended up going through another trail, and man, lo and behold, we come up. Boom, there's a creek again, or a river, like, not a river, but a stream flowing. And I'm going, and I'm seeing houses over here, nice houses. I'm going, Man, they, they have to go through this to get to their house. And then I saw the said, sign that said dead end. I said, well, man, that's it. 
That's the only way in. They got to go through here. And she'd already jumped out of the car. She's like, no, 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 man. I'm no, 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 no. She's looking at that thing. Because we already seen one day before. She's looking at, no, no, no. We ain't going to do that. I'm not going to do that. So I kept looking at it from the car. I'm thinking, no, I can do this. I said, do you want me to go across and come back and pick you up? And then finally she got in the car and we went across and it did rub the bottom of our soul car. But I didn't care. I was going to make sure I get through there. So I'm thinking, man, we did it. Praise God. Hallelujah, man. So we're just cruising on, going to our trail, you know, following the thing. And bang, there's another creek we got to cross. Oh, this is getting bad now, man. And I'm looking at it and we both sit in the car and I go, no, I think we got it. I think we can do that. So, man, we just barreled in there and, man, that water come up, you know, kind of like on the hood. I'm thinking. Man, I, I'm the man here. I can't be caught, you know, I got to go with this thing, you know. So, I mean, I just, whoo, out of there, man. You know what I mean? So, we made it, you know. But, but the reality is, is that current's going downstream. And when you give your heart to Jesus and you begin to do what God's called you to do, God literally will turn your life around. Y'all heard that, right? We sing that song, turn your life around. He'll turn you around and then he gets you doing what? You're going back upstream now. You've left the downstream because everybody's going with the what? Flow. Go with the flow, baby. Don't, don't interrupt the flow. Just go with the flow. Matter of fact, I got some flow masters. I'm getting ready to, put them I'm getting ready to put some. I might let it flow. Hallelujah. But just go with the flow. Go with the flow. But God's saying, no, I don't want you to go with the flow. I want you to go against the flow. So when you get saved and you give your life to Jesus, you begin to do what the Bible says, you're going against the grain. You can be called names. You can be laughed at. You can be made fun of. You can have all kinds of things going. But you're so excited about God when you first get saved. Come on, somebody. When you first meet Jesus, you're so excited you don't even care. He's like, hey, bro, what are you doing, man? Oh, man, I just love Jesus, man. Come on, man, you used to party with me. I don't care, man, Jesus is it. And, man, you're just in that canoe, and you're going wide open upstream, and you could care less. But over time, you start listening to the voices around you. You start listening to, to, to the, the ones going with the flow, with the flow. And then the next thing you know, as you're listening to them, to say, hey, man, won't you come over here and do this with me? Hey, won't you do this with me? You quit paddling, and then all of a sudden your canoe turns around, and you're going back downstream. This goes on all the time with believers. It does. They'll come in church. That's why you should never not go to church, because your canoe could be going with the flow. And you need to get in here and get straightened up and start going with the direction you need to go. Amen? That's why church is vital. Okay, you got God, you got family, but God and church are right there together, okay? And the reason why he established it is he knew that sometimes we would end up going with the flow. We'd end up getting caught up going with the flow, and he knew that we needed to flow in the church to where we could get, could get a word that says, hey, no, God's got you. Turn around. Let's get going. You're the head not to tell. Above and not beneath. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Let's go. You can do this. And then that fires you up and you get going again. So we don't want to go downstream with the world. We want to go upstream with God. Amen? And I can tell you guys, when you do that, you don't realize how many people you're affecting in your life by doing that. Sometimes your walk with God can just seem so like nobody knows it. Like it's making no difference at all. But I'm telling you, man, if you'll continue to go upstream and, and do those things, all the people that are going with the flow, guess what? People that are going against the flow, what do they do? They stand out, right? They're going to stand out. Now, again, you might get a finger shot, bird. You may get some cuss words. You may, you're an idiot. You're a bigot. You're a hater. You may get all that until they've been told they're going to die in two weeks. Whoa, 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 where's that guy going up the string? <laughs> hey, man, hey, 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 come here, hey, hey, you know what I'm saying? You never know when that day is going to happen. But if we continue to go downstream, when God's telling us to go upstream, how many people would just let this, you know, fail? And you got the life of God on the inside of you, amen? amen? Hallelujah. So does God's will, doing God's will is not easy to do, but is rewarding those that choose it over their own will. Jesus put it this way in John 5, 30. He said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus also shared the struggle of your will versus God's will in Luke twenty-two forty-one. 41. Now, this is where he is just a few days from being hung on a cross and, 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 and just his life given, okay, and him going through hell on earth. So he's in this garden, and he's praying. But yet he don't know what he's going to go through totally. He just knows that something is getting ready to happen major. 
But his prayer is it's really intense. So we're going to pick it up with Jesus in the garden in verse 41. He says, he withdrew about a stone's throw away from them, his disciples, and he knelt down and he prayed. And he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Notice that he was praying in the garden and he's saying, God, in essence, I don't want to do this. This looks hard. This is going to be tough. But guess what? I'm going to do your will and not my own. Is he the only one that's going to face things like that? Mm -mm. No, he's not. But you know the difference between Jesus and a lot of people? Because a lot of people won't even take this and pray like this. They're just going to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, no matter what. And God will let you do that. Okay? But I want you to pay close attention what happens after he decided to say, you know what, I'm not going to do what I want to do. I want to do what you asked me to do. Watch what happens in the next verse. And it says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and did what? Strengthened him. Notice that the help came after he was willing to do what God told him to do. And this will be the way it is throughout life for me and you. There's going to be times you don't want to quit what you're doing. You don't want to quit that. You don't want to walk away from that. And you'll be able to keep it and you can continue to do what you do. And it will continue to cause problems in your life. But the minute you say, God, you know what? As much as I want to do it, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to do your will and not mine. Let's go. Look what happened after that. It's the same thing that's going to happen to your life and my life if we will choose his will over ours. And it's a choice. You have to make that decision. Jesus could have walked away from this whole deal, man. He could have said, you know what? Forget that, man. You know what? I, no, I'm not doing that. That's too tough. He could have. No, that was Jesus. He was going to have to do it no matter what. No, he, his will. His will was there. Amen? And we see a clear distinction between God's will and Jesus' will. We have two choices in life, and that is pretty simple, and that's the way I like to keep things. Do y'all like simple or do y'all like difficult? I, I love simplicity. Okay? I, do, I, listen to, I love listening to Bible teachers that will go way down in the deep and scuba dive way on down. I love listening to those people teach. But the reality is, is when you're preaching like that, you're talking to a very small percentage of people, okay? Because most of the people that I run with are like me. Very simple. Don't give me no complex stuff, amen? I want it simple. I mean, I really do. I like one plus one equals four. I mean, to, <laughs> come on, wake up, Hallelujah. God's will or your will? Jesus had a choice as well, and it was not easy all the time to do what God wanted him to do. Doing God's will will be the best thing that you and I could ever do. So how can you know God's will? These are two things you need to keep. If you're going to go get a tattoo, and I'm not against tattoos, okay? If you want to get a tattoo, here's two words that you can tattoo. Cindy, you can get this tattoo, okay? You're going to see Cindy and Mary kicked up in a tattoo shop. Woo! Yeah, come on, baby. Let's roll with it. But these are two words that you, 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 can, you, actually, you need to live by. It's humility and faith. You need to be able to humble yourself. The only way you're ever going to know God's will and then walk it out is you've got to be able to humble yourself. Because you always wants to do what you want to do. I mean, we're the main character in our own movies. If you don't believe me... Somebody take a picture of this group right here and then hand it to Holly. Holly's going to pull that picture up and what's Holly going to do? She's looking for the main character, not the, sub, the other characters. She ain't over there looking at Luke. No. How do I look? Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then we'll look around. Okay. So we're our own favorite hero of our own stories. Okay. So we have a will, but we want to have humility and faith in front of us all the time. Because guess what God's going to do and His Word's going to do? So I'm taking a while to get to what I need to get to, okay? And we're going to start a little light. I'm going to give you two of them before I leave, okay? But I can tell you, in the days ahead, it's not going to be easy. I'm going to say some things. I'm not going to say. I'm going to repeat some things that's in this book right here that is His will. And guess what? Don't get mad at me. I love you, but that's why I'm telling you. But we're going to start light today. It's going to be real light today. But the momentum is going to start getting on up there. And I'm going, to be, I'm going to be sharing some things with you over the next several weeks that you 
have probably dodged because you didn't understand it. You know, when you read something in the Bible you don't understand, you know what that means? You don't understand. <laughs> That's all that means. Is there understanding in it? Oh, yeah. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to help us with some of those things. So God's Word is His will for our life. This book right here is His will for our life. This is why it's so important to read it and study it because it will tell us what to do and what not to do. Has anybody ever read in this book what not to do, but yet you want to do it anyway? Come on. Has anybody ever read in this book what not to do and you're still doing it? <laughs> Come on. I'm telling you, man, this book will help us out. Is God trying to ruin your fun? No. He's trying to bring life to you. Life is in the obedience. Death is in the disobedience. So if you want life, energy, love, peace, and joy, then you need to do what he says, okay? He knows what's best. You know, the old saying, Father knows best, it applies to this Father here, not this one, okay? Because I can mess it up sometimes. Hallelujah. So, simple instructions from the Bible that will lead to great success. Jesus put it this way in Luke 4, verse 4. But Jesus answered him, the devil, he's having a conversation with the devil right here, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Again, a choice. You can live by your words, or you can choose to live by God's words. One brings life, one brings death. So I'm going to give you two real quick before we leave today. And then we'll, we'll look at some more in the weeks ahead. And I won't go over a lot of what I went over every week, even though I may. Because you, you know what? You need to hear it over and over again. I want you to have Romans 12, 1 and 2 memorized before we get done. And maybe three or four translations. Okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want you to have it etched on you. But remember, you can get the humility and faith tattooed on any part of your body. Okay? That you want to. That is. Can I do that? That's probably not good, right? Scratch that, Facebook. You know, delete that. Okay, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, so let's begin to look at what is God's will. Now, again, I could have started with God's will is for us to love everybody. That had been an obvious one, right? I could have started with that one, and, and we'll get to that one. That's probably the last one. <laughs> That's pretty obvious that we need to love God and we need to love people. Duh. I don't want to start there, okay, because I, I just think we need to get some things straight. 3 John chapter 2 says this, Beloved, I pray that in every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as I know your soul prospers spiritually. So the first thing that we need to know that is the will of God is God's will is for us to prosper and be in good health. God's will is for us to prosper and to be in good health. John is sharing with us God's will for your life and that God wants good for you all the time. He wants to add things to your life and not take away. You know, there's many people that don't serve God today because they feel like that if they do, they're going to have to give up everything they have. That's a lie. Man, you ain't given nothing up by serving God. If anything, you're getting ready to enjoy more than you ever could imagine. God's will for our lives is that, that we be prosperous and we be in good health. That's God's will. So if you're not prospering today and if you're not in great health, you got good news. Okay? It ain't over. His will is for you to have those things. And you may say, well, Nathan, uh, how do I get that if that's His will and I need it right now? I'm glad you asked. When you get with God and you begin to spend time with Him... He begins to spend time with you. What he has begins to get in you. And when what he has gets inside of you, I'm telling you, you're going to start seeing things in your life change. And see, the thing about it too is, is a lot of people don't even know it's God's will for them to have good health. They think, what, I mean, maybe I'm the only one who does this, but you know, when you start having some symptoms... I guarantee you that. Let me just say this. If I went to the doctor and they said, Nathan, you have stage four cancer. Okay. Let's just say whatever it is. The first thing that I probably would do, maybe y'all are not guilty of this. I'd probably think, man, what have I been eating lately? What have I been drinking lately? Have I been eating and doing the right things with my health? 
That's me. Now, y'all probably would be thinking something totally different. But most of the time, we try to go to the natural of the reason why we have what we have. We start trying to figure out, what did I do? How did I mess this up? And the reality is, is that the enemy is trying to come in and destroy your life. And God is saying by this right here that I want you to be in good health. So if you'll spend time with me and you'll get me inside of you, when that does come, you will speak to that the way I've already spoke to that. And you can see healing inside your body. But see, if we don't believe God's will is to heal us or God's will is to prosper us, when we discover a big bill that comes in our mailbox and we lay it on the table and it is yelling and screaming, it's got a shotgun in its hand and it's really intimidating, we're going to try to figure out, I need to get five jobs to pay this. Because we know Abba Father would want me to work from seven in the morning till seven in the morning again so I could pay this bill. It's my fault. I got myself in this situation. Surely he, he wants me to pay the price to learn a lesson because that's just the way we think in this world. Now, again, he does want you to learn a lesson. He don't want you to do it. He don't want you using credit cards and getting all in debt and all that. But if something happens and you need help, when you ask God for help, that don't necessarily always mean that you need to help him help you. Can I say that? Okay. All right. He, he's God. You're not. If you're already working and you're doing what you can do, do that. But let God bring what you need. Amen? Because if I've got cancer, there's nothing I can stop doing to remove the cancer. Okay? It's what I can believe in now. I've got to believe in something bigger than me to get me what I need. But a lot of times we don't do that because we don't know God's will. All we know is God's church. We know God's songs. We know a little bit about what God does. But he wants you to get it in you. That way when the enemy comes in, and he's going to come in. Has anybody had the enemy come in any time in your life? One person. Hallelujah. I am in here with a bunch of Jesus' second cousins. Man, y'all are cool. I'm glad to be here with y'all, man, today. Thank God. Hallelujah. No, I've had the devil come in my life yesterday. <laughs> I mean, I mean we, he is there. You know what I'm saying? And he's trying to destroy us. God is saying, look, get me in you. That's what we're doing. I want you to know, and I want you to go home. Okay, well, the pastor said that God's will is for us to prosper and be in health. I'm going to go see what all is about prosperity and being in good health. Get in this book and find out and get it in you. And then that way when the devil comes to try to take it away from you, you say, boy, why don't you get your hands off me? What the heck? When he tries to get you to get in debt or slide that card or, or sign that loan of 80 payments of zero interest, and I mean, you'll say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not falling for it. Yeah, but if you do, you're not going to get it. And you want it. You know you want it. No, I can wait. God will bring it to me. Amen? We just got to understand God's will and get it inside of us. That way, when the things of this world start crumbling in and lack comes in and sickness comes in, the will of God comes out of us. Because we are in Him, and He's in us, amen? And that's what we want to have. Not a bunch of hearsay, well, I think the preacher said that He'll heal. No, you're going to die, brother. I'm just telling you like it is. But God wants us to be healed, amen? And dying's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it is. I mean, if you died and you're a Christian, glory to God, that's the best thing that ever could happen, really. You're in heaven, hallelujah. But man, we want to show the world that if you live for God, there's benefits in serving God, amen? Not just going to church. Not just going to church and spending your money. Well, every time I go to church, all they want is my money. You hear that more than anything else. How about every time I go to church, I get healed? How about every time I go to church, man, something good happens to me? Every time I go to church, somebody gives me money. I want to be a church, man. We, we come to church with cash in our pockets. Let's start doing that. Go get you some cash from the ATM before you come to church next Sunday. And let's just be praying, God, what would you have me to do? We'll be just known as a church that just gives money away when people come in. Oh, well, man, if you do that, that you know, that you, you, may, you may go broke. ha, <laughs> ha. Who's, who's behind that comment? I'm telling you guys, let's unleash the will of God on the earth. That's what God's wanting to do. Amen? We ain't going to go without. You come into church believing God. Hey, look, man, I know I'm doing good today, but I'm ready to lay my hands on somebody and pray for somebody to be healed today. Amen? Hey, ain't going to be sick going on around here. I mean, let's, let's, let's believe God for these things. Hallelujah. Church should be a place you come and get something, not that you feel like you're giving something. No, man, we come to church to give stuff away. Hallelujah. God is all about being a success on earth. He just wants you to do it His way. Father knows best. Hallelujah. But we have to, 
We live in a world full of demons and evil people. So the Bible, or the will of God, tells us in 2 Timothy 3.12, and I know y'all ain't memorizing this one at all. Okay, I just want to throw this in here because, again, it highlights the one who's behind doing the wrong things. It says, Indeed, all who delight in pursuing righteousness and are determined to live godly lives in Christ Jesus. Whoo! It's pretty powerful there, Paul. <laughs> will be hunted down and persecuted because of their faith. The enemy is coming after what you got. That's why it's set up to where when you hear something good and you leave, the enemy comes to try to get what you got away from you. He tries to make life more hellish when you leave church than necessarily when you came to church. Well, I went to church Sunday and my husband walked out on me. My dog died. My fish died. Uh, I lost my job. That's what he's banking on, that something in your life the next week he can point to the reason why it happened is he can connect it back to you went to church, you prayed, you read your Bible, you, you, you're not you know, drinking coffee no more, that's why that happened. I mean, he's just trying to link up whatever you got help from God with, he's trying to link up the reason why it ain't working back to God. And you got to say no to that crap, amen? So I just wanted to read that to where I know you ain't going to memorize that, but just know that the enemy is trying to come in and take away some things. And we all might have some days that are not good as other days. But we can keep our heads up and know that if God be for us, then who can be against us? We will not be in those bad days long at all. We will have way more good days than bad ones. The devil is just hoping that when you have those bad days, you will blame God or get discouraged and walk away from him. Never, never, never let that be an option because God is good all the time and he will be there with you forever. Giving up cannot be an option for you to see what God has in store for you just ahead. Jesus walks away from that prayer in the garden and he goes his way. He never gets the help that he needs from the angels. Number two, and we're going to close right here. God's will is for us to be thankful in every situation. God's will is for us to be thankful in every situation. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says it this way. It says, In every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for our life is to be thankful all the time. Thankful people are favored of the Lord. Thankful people get what others complain about not having. Being thankful will help you live a blessed life. And before I closed, uh, Chris took Greek. You know, he's, he's a Greek theology theologian. So I sent him a word and he translated it in Greek. He's really good. Where's that word at? Hallelujah. Look at that. Come on, y'all give it up for Chris, man. Look at that. It's a little bit of Greek, baby. I like it. Come on. I wanted y'all to see this because I got some points I want to make about this before we close today, okay? And you may say, well, Nathan, how can you be thankful when something bad's going on, okay? And that's a good question. That's a really good question. If God is saying it's the will of God for us to be thankful all the time, is it hard to be thankful when something bad happens? It is, ain't it? I mean, to be honest with you. But God is telling us that we, we need to do it. And I wanted y'all to see it in the Greek to where you'll know why you should do it and what happens when you do it, even when you don't feel like doing it. But in the, in the Greek, thankful is you, x-rays, okay? Which the you part of it means good, and the x-rays means grace. The definition is properly acknowledging that God's grace works well. Literally, thankful for God's good grace. I want y'all to see this right here, that God's grace works well. This grace is an empowerment, that means when you're faced with things going on in your life, God's grace or His empowerment works well in that situation, even if you don't feel like it does. He goes over our emotions and He begins to deal with that thing that's causing you problems, causing you hurt, causing you pain. God's grace. That's why if we... Have you ever been around thankful people? They stand out. How many of y'all would rather be around thankful people than complaining people? I mean, y'all been, we've been around those people. They complain all the time. They come into the office all the time. Oh, God, did you see the news? My God. Man. I mean, they just want to talk, you know, and probably talked a lot about COVID. Talk about, I mean, just talk, 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 negative, negative, negative. Man, you just want to say, Jesus, man. You know what I'm saying? 
But when somebody comes in and says, man, whoo, man, I tell you what, man, we just, I, you know what, Th this business is doing good. I'm doing good. I mean, and they're just thankful and they're happy. It's just something that attracts you to those people. Well, God is saying that when our circumstances are not where they need to be, if we'll take on the person of that annoying person in the office that's really happy, and we'll begin to be happy that God is God, He's good, He's got this, you may not understand everything, you may not know what's going to happen today or tomorrow, but if you'll just be thankful that He's God, and that He's got you, and that His Word works, it never fails, in that thankfulness will be your provision, will be what you need. And that's all God's saying. Because if you take the other way, and you're unthankful, guess what door you open up at this point? You open up the door to the enemy, and he can come in and have his way. Psalms 107.8 says this, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. 1 Corinthians 15.57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to be thankful to God all the time. All the time. So we learned today that it is His will for us to prosper and be in good health. And it is His will that we be thankful people. But you know, in order to know God's will, as we close today, the first step in knowing God's will is you must be born again. You must know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if you're here today or you're online watching us and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior... I would love for you to pray this prayer with me and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And you say, well, you mean, is it that easy? All I got to do is just pray a simple prayer and, and he'll save me. It ain't the prayer, it's the heart. And it says you open up your heart and you look and you say, I need somebody to help me because what I'm doing right now ain't working. What I've done in the past, it ain't working. I need his help. And, and Jesus wants to step into your situation right now. No matter how ugly or messy it is, He wants to step into your mess. Now, maybe your life's going good. You may think, well, man, I just, you know, right now I'm doing really good. I don't really know if I really need a Jesus. Well, you need a Savior. All of us need a Savior. Because the clock is going to strike midnight soon, whether He comes back or you leave this planet. And you want to make sure you're right with Him. So if everybody would, bow your head and close your eyes and, and just pray this in your heart after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. I turn from my way of doing life. And I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that God raised him up from the dead on the third day. And now I believe, Jesus, with all my heart that you are my Lord and my Savior. Help me, Jesus, live for you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for going all the way for me. I thank you, Jesus, for saving my life today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah.